Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Casey Tay Kochin. Uh, I'm the chairman of Smart Cities Network. Uh, you are about to participate in this particular dialogue session together with me, Dr. Ambu from Iria, and I will first provide a brief introduction to uh, this particular dialogue. Uh, a very quick introduction about area. I won't go into the details because Dr. Ambu will share that. Uh, it is one of the top regional economic policy think tanks in, in this part of the world. And this project is a one-year research study on realizing smart cities. We launched in Chiang Mai last July, where I also participated. And essentially, the research project will perform the need and gap analysis of converting a city into a smart city with the three following areas, which I think uh, Dr. Ambu will share more. In this particular dialogue, uh, Dr. Ambu, as I call him, uh, will have the overview of the, of the study, what's the update today, and then what's next. And uh, I'm moderating the session. This is a group photo taken on the 23rd of July last year uh, at the end of the session where we had senior management and staff of area uh, participants from the cities, uh, speakers, uh, a few speakers and industry partners. Uh, what I presented actually could be uh, kind of a, give you an introduction to lessons from Singapore. So I shared about the Singapore as a case studies, uh, what, what did we do? And uh, this is really a summary uh, based on the objective of the workshop. So if you look on the left, uh, the workshop objective was to sort of examine how cities would embark uh, into a smart city program. And I shared about how Singapore did that in 2012. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, also to analyze the critical needs and the gaps on realizing smart cities. And I uh, also gave uh, an outline of the different key initiatives of the smart nation. Uh, so the way that I have approached it is really the nuts and bolts of any smart city implementation always starts with A, an awareness to uh, who has done what before and internally to uh, how people could actually uh, evaluate themselves. B is about analyzing uh, the critical need of the country or the city. And uh, from there you will learn to the uh, new skills and new expertise, new platforms to build the capabilities. And last but not least, is really uh, to integrate into existing uh, structures and ecosystems. And uh, what we hope to do is uh, through this research study that we have a call for action for cities to uh, pursue their own uh, agenda in terms of smart cities. So we have Really, uh, these delegates who join us uh, from on the left side, Billy from Jakarta and uh, Venture from uh, Ram Prabang. And we have, of course, our uh, Dr. Ambu on the left here. And uh, so we, we have uh, key staff from uh, area joining us, including the cities represented from Chiang Mai, uh, Jakarta, Makassar, Johor Bahru, Ram Prabang and two industry partners, Oracle and NEC. Uh, a month after I presented that, I was invited in a co-organized event by IRIA and ASEAN, uh, the connectivity division invited me to share about creating enabling environment for smart cities. And uh, I did that in which uh, I outlined two key challenges of smart cities. Uh, one is political leadership and the second is funding. Uh, thereafter, I have actually formed a social media group on WhatsApp. Uh, we actually invite people to join us. We have over 230 members in that group now and there are members from all over the world. It is probably one of the most uh, comprehensive and a uh, group of professionals uh, to understand about smart cities in ASEAN. Uh, the next work group session was in uh, earlier this year uh, in February. Uh, unfortunately, I, I could not go for different reasons. 
but I gave a online presentation lessons of, from smart cities implementation in Asia. What are the critical success factors? And it was held in uh, Salem in, in, uh, in India. So what I did was to give a summary of uh, what makes other, other countries successful. And I think the best example of smart cities from a national agenda basis is really India with 100 smart cities mission uh, by PM Modi launched in 2015, where they have also allocated a budget of about $14 billion uh, to allow the cities to get the funding, create a new uh, private sector entity, uh, a special vehicle, they call it, and, and to rejuvenate uh, 500 other cities. And I did share about how China did uh, the 500 cities and the other cities as well. But the summary of the two critical success factor here is really uh, about, about uh, the Singapore experience. And I have to say that while we launched Smart Nation in 2014, it was not really until 2017 that Singapore began to uh, fast track their Smart Nation agenda because they reported directly to the Prime Minister. So what we had is really the, the need for... Now, excuse me, uh, if you can join in, could you uh, read yourself? Right. So uh, what we had is really uh, the ability for any country to really embark on smart city or smart nation. They have to be at the highest level of political leadership. And the second, and which is really a pain point for a lot of uh, stakeholders is about funding, right? And Singapore, credit to the Singapore government has rebranded their IT budget yearly as a smart nation budget. So we allocate roughly about $2 billion to $2.5 billion every year to, to actually uh, have IT enablement, uh, digital enablement, and the transformation are considered smart nation, but not all countries have started to do that. And I hope that this kind of an example would encourage more cities to do that. So this is my last slide before I pass over to Dr. Ambu. Uh, what are we here for? There are three main objectives for this dialogue, and it is aligned to what the ASEAN Smart Cities Network aims to do. Uh, first is to facilitate cooperation. And we hope that we will allow uh, cities to cooperate between uh, each other, which I, I do now with some of the cities. And the second is to catalyze bankable projects with the private sector. The large corporate sectors have uh, got funding and some of which they are prepared to invest in uh, proof of concept or pilot projects. So we hope that even through the foundation of the private sector, we can catalyze bankable projects too. More in the area of the public-private partnership. And uh, I will share about the public, private and people partnership that involves the academic institutions later part uh, of this dialogue. And we want to secure support from external uh, ASEAN partners and uh, EVIA in my view is an external uh, partner. So right now, uh, what I will do is that I will request uh, Dr. Ambu to share his screen uh, and I will stop my share. Thank you so much. And Dr. Ambu, please go ahead to unmute yourself and uh, please proceed with your presentation by sharing your screen, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Casey. And uh, good afternoon from Jakarta, ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls. Uh, this is our pleasure to share some of our works about the smart cities that is we have started the last year. But many of you may not know about IRIA and uh, IRIA is an international organization that is um, based in Jakarta. It is established in uh, 2007 to provide the support for the ASEAN and East Asia summits. Uh, through our policy research. IDEA conducts uh, research on three pillars. Uh, one is uh, deepening the economic integration. 
second narrowing the developmental gaps and third is the sustainable development uh, we do capacity building uh, in the name of uh, seminars and workshops they are targeted for the senior policy makers researchers and the business managers to strengthen the link between the research and the policy making or more for the evidence based policy making so this project on realizing the smart cities a kind of integrated research and capacity development program started in 2019 and uh, it has uh, two more phases to go why we started this project is uh, many of you know this uh, uh, smart city and it is a kind of buzzword it has a different meaning to different people uh, but we wanted to see zoom in and we wanted to contact uh, kind of uh, a pathway or a kind of blueprint where the current cities uh, get into the journey of uh, smart cities so this study started with this objective of uh, uh, measuring the smartness of the city through the use of uh, key performance indicators and the second uh, to see what is the economics of uh, smart cities what are the cost and what are the benefits and what will be the next uh, socio environmental benefits the citizens of the cities can get and the third objective is to analyze the policy gaps or where the policy integration is needed so the scope of this project is uh, five sectors where we believe the smart city programs can bring a service efficiency there is the energy sector mobility sector uh, waste sector water sector underlying is the ict sector so what uh, i would like to do in the next 20 25 minutes is uh, uh, give some snapshots of what we are doing by answering these three questions one is um, why we need smart cities it is a kind of review of uh, urban development paradigm that is happening in this region and second thing is uh, what constitute a smart city this is uh, we closely observed uh, what is happening in the 26 cities that is the uh, case you mentioned short while ago as a part of the asian smart city network then the third uh, one question is uh, how to measure the smartness uh, i'll presenting some of uh, our uh, quantifiable results that is coming from our studies before getting into it and we need to understand that is the cities are a complex self organizing and non linear systems and they evolve and change autonomously this is the clutch that is we have and then why we need smart cities here we need to see and you need to see three unmeaning inconvenient truths the first truth is um, the urbanization urbanization is a kind of unavoidable evil people are migrating i think this region this sugar shows that is the how the people or the urban population is improving it is singapore it is already 100% but if you see there is a growing trend of urbanization increasingly more and more people are moving to the cities it brings challenges to providing the facilities providing the services as well as the a better governance delivery this urbanization also resulted in the concentration of the economic power uh, that is happening in this uh, region here you can see that is uh, by 2020 this large cities and uh, the next tier cities will contribute about 65% of the gdp in the asian countries so there is an economic mighty uh, that necessitate the cities to become kind of uh, new competitive zones to attract the investments the second inconvenient truth is our cities 
are becoming a pollution heaven. The world's 10 most polluted cities are in this region, in the Asia Pacific. Yeah. In addition to that, the total carbon footprint is increasing every day. If you see in this figure and uh, the Singapore with the less pollution, with the less population has the more carbon footprint. The Jakarta on, Jakarta on the other hand has the more population but the less footprint. But we can expect the worst to come in the coming decades because of the more resource use and the energy use challenges. And the third inconvenient truth that cities represent is the inequality. Yes, we have seen that is the, on the left hand side, you can see that Guinea coefficient. On the most of the cities, it is, it is nearly 0.5 and 0.4 and like that. Here we can see that is the, these cities also, they are on one hand, they are successful in reducing the poverty by bringing the more interventions and the more economic growth. But at the same time, they also become a source of inequality. So as happened in the COVID and these cities also become a kind of uh, epicenter for these uh, pandemic diseases or uh, the disaster effects effect. So the resilience, the less resilience capacity is also another inconvenient truth that we can see in the cities. But there is also good news and the good news is coming from the technology. The cities are front runners in absorbing these technologies and invent their own. Here it shows that is the how this e-government development index has been changed over years. Here in this region, almost all countries except two has improved their e-governance. E-governance means the scope and the quality of the online services, status of the ICT infrastructure, and the inherent human capital. So these three inconvenient truths and then one opportunity represents why we need smart cities. This figure summarizes the challenges that poses, the global challenges the cities faces, and it's also an opportunity that is bringing through this uh, introduction of the integrated ICT technologies. Here, smart city is seen as a way, that is a, one of the ways to support and drive the economic growth the bring competitiveness to these regions, as well as achieving the social cohesion and the environmental sustainability. This is summarizes why we need smart cities. But what is smart city? Then we don't have a clear and an easy answer. The answer depends upon where the focus is, and who is giving that answer. Here in the academic literature, you can see wide varying definitions of the smart cities. It has a different meaning to different people. But if you group together and see cut through dimensions of the smart cities, you can see it is basically an effective integration of uh, digital, physical, and human systems to deliver a sustainable prosperous and inclusive future for its citizens. This is uh, definition is reflected in the European Parliament. These are the European Parliament in 2014 defined smart cities uh, one that is seeking the uh, public issues via ICT based solutions on the basis of multi stakeholder and municipality based partnership. But uh, in the Singapore after four years Vivian Balakrishnan, Singapore foreign minister, and he defined, he bring a kind of a political color to this uh, ASEAN smart city movement. It shows it is not only about the technology, but is how we are applying the technologies to improve the quality of the citizens and to create a greater opportunities for everyone to prosper. So this is the, uh, what basics, basic is core of uh, smart city is the application of these uh, information and communication technologies to increase or to maximize the benefit of the society. 
So there are 26 cities that has been already signed into the ASEAN Smart City program. And we area conducted a kind of a desk review of what is the content of the smart cities. Each city has uh, uh, released their vision and also the mission documents. Here we found uh, nearly 22% of the smart cities talk about uh, the smart governance. And 16% of them, uh, basically their focus is more on the ICT and the big data. And then 13% of the smart city vision documents, they say what they, the more about the smart environment or the sustainability aspects of it. And 11% of them, they talk about the smart mobility and 9% of these uh, 26 uh, documents talk about the smart economy. So this is the kind of content. It shows that is the, this uh, smart city network or the definition of the smart cities varies from person to person, but the core remains the smart governance, ICT data, and the smart environment. So smart city is, if you come club together, and uh, if you see from the ASEAN perspective, they have been trying several ways and several pathways to bring the solutions uh, to resolve the multiple challenges, the environmental challenges, economic challenges, and the societal challenges. Here it sees it represents harnessing the digital dividends to boost the growth and governance and the expand the opportunities. This is about the nutshell of ASEAN Smart City Network. Will it be a best option to resolve the new and multiple challenges of the service delivery? We don't have the answers. That's why we started, this area has started this research that by particularly measuring the smartness of these uh, um, smart cities, as well as studying the details of the economics of the smartness. So when we get into the smart city architecture, this is a kind of a blueprint uh, we have. What could constitute a smart city? It has uh, four layers. The first is a sensor layer, which basically captures all the data. And the second is the transit layer, it is a kind of network layer where different infrastructures are combined together and use this data. And the third layer is the analysis layer where the data is uh, analyzed and the data integration is happening. And the final layer that is the application layer that is where most of these smart city citizens will be seeing it. That include the disaster management and the health monitoring and the energy efficiency improvement and the traffic and the transport. Uh, sessions. So these uh, four layers are built over a value chain that start from the smart modules and getting into it give a kind of a smart city as a service provider. So these uh, two systems, these four layers and the value chain need a strategic collaboration. There's much more innovations in the public private domain. This is what we see as a kind of a standard smart city architecture that is built upon the IoT infrastructure under the different layer conditions. So we used it and we developed a kind of a, what could be the technology roadmap for the smart cities. So this is the kind of core that is the area uh, built upon for the smartness analysis as well as developing the key performance indicators. So it has the three layers. The first layer is uh, the core layer is the integration data integration platform that is built upon three different pillars. One is the information technology and the communication technology and the data storage management systems. And here our focus is how we can bring the service delivery, particularly in the three sectors of energy, transport, water, and waste management sector. So this, uh, if you analyze these things and if you combine together, this is what really an operational definition of the smart city. It is from the data, from the instrumentation to intelligence through integration. These are the three I's are the basic core of the smart cities. Instrumentation is the collecting the collection of the data using the sensors. Integration is connect and bring this data across the cities and finally, it results in the intelligent systems. 
So this objective of three I's will be translated into efficiency, that is the doing more with the less inputs, and innovations through the collaboration at the scale, and finally inclusion, that is where everyone gets the benefits, the benefits are distributed. So it is a clear win-win solution. This is what constitutes the smart cities. So the next level of our research is, um, we learned that is uh, why we need smart cities and we know what constitutes the smart cities. And the th third thing is how we can measure these uh, smart cities. That need uh, three steps. One is the uh, development of the performance indicators or a common framework to assess these 26 cities. Then identify what are the net benefits and the barriers. And finally, develop a common targets and the financial models. So we did the study and with uh, uh, some of the cities uh, uh, volunteered to become a case study, starting with Jakarta, Makassar, Jokarbor, and Luang Prabang, as well as Singapore. And we also have some of the uh, standard uh, uh, reference cases, the New York and Takamatsu, Japan, the Salem in India and Sydney in Australia. So the overall objective is to examine how these cities can embark into a smart city program and uh, analyzing what level of uh, smartness they are and what will be the estimating the cost and benefits. So we developed about um, nine uh, core performance, core group of indicators. And why this is nine? And basically it is a combination of fuzzy logic theory that is we used. And here we defined that is a, two basic domains of the indicators, the core indicators that can be used by all the cities universally. Then this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, universal performance indicators could be tailor made for the cities because each city has uh, different uh, requirements and each vision and the mission statements differ. So based on the universal set of indicators, these cities can come down, draw down to have the tailor-made uh, city-specific indicators. So this is a kind of uh, 70 indicators that is uh, we, we have been developed and we have been testing it with these uh, different cities based on the analysis based the data availability and totally these 70 indicators will be transformed into a kind of index systems where you can see that is uh, where the cities are relatively placed under each category of uh, this technology advancement. This is a kind of uh, example for Singapore and uh, most of the Singapore, most of the data is available in the, in the public domain. So we took it and we analyzed it, uh, for example, in the case of ICT. And here ICT, this is the current level, about 91% of the households has this uh, access to this internet. And uh, the future target is 2025, the government has 98%. So our assessment is that is, uh, it is really high levels of uh, readiness in this case. Uh, but if you go to this uh, energy dimensions, particularly in the case of energy efficiency and the renewable energy, and we cannot say, and still Singapore is struggling and uh, it could be categorized as uh, still in the stages of the law that need more attention and more work. So it will lead into a kind of identifying why this happens and where the policy gaps are. So what our final objective is uh, to bring a kind of metric system like this and where you can evaluate uh, or you can, the cities, the relative position where they are placed and how, what are the gaps and how they can move forward and what could be the uh, new technologies advancement they can get in and what could be the good results in what type of financial models they need. So this is the objective of uh, our first objective and this key performance indicators, this is a, a work that is in progress and it will be finalized in a month or two. And the second component is the economics of becoming smart city. And this is uh, it's another complicated and here we need, uh, we need a kind of uh, uh, deployment cost. How much each city has required for this identified technologies. I told you before, this is a kind of a technology roadmap. This technology roadmap has the different categories of the technologies. And if this technologies categories has been um, inserted into city and what will be the impact? That is the benefit component. 
the benefit happens has the tangible benefits and the non-tangible benefits, as well as the monetary, the benefit that could be quantified and that benefits not could, cannot be monetized. So we are doing that kind of analysis. One example that is we are doing it for Chiang Mai is that is there are two case analysis. For example, it is the business as usual. This is, a, this is what, what current uh, uh, Chiang Mai smart city, if it is implemented in 2030, it will reduce 0.5% uh, of this uh, energy de demand. But on the other hand, if they are absorbing all this technology that is we identified and we create a kind of a, a digital system supported by analogical uh, analog systems, then we find about 60% of increased opportunity for the city to reduce that emissions and then energy use. So this is the, this reduced emissions are really a quantity of benefits for the cities. So this is what we finally aim for these smart cities, the, the, the value analysis process. So if, if all this technology has been absorbed, and what will be the net reduction in the energy consumption? It could be in the range of four to seven percent, and the reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions in seventeen percent. In the transport sector, how much time that is you can see as as passengers. If you are adapting a kind of a smart uh, transport systems uh, supported by your APIs or these uh, new applications on the internet platforms, uh, here about twenty eight percent. Time could be saved, and if you, if you monetize everything, it will be coming in the range of about seventy billion. I think this is a kind of a rough and a very very crude estimate that is we had, and we are defining our methodologies to quantify it. So this is only happening in the transport sector, and if you move into the other sector that is energy and the waste and water, I think we can have much more benefits, monetable and uh, monetary benefits we can calculate. So what our preliminary conclusions that is coming from this study is the ASEAN smart city network is moving well, and but so far they fail to see this opportunities that is available for these uh, low carbon transformation plans. But however, these smart city strategies represent an opportunity for a paradigm shift. The second conclusion that is we uh, arrived in is uh, the defining characteristic of the ASEAN smart city model is the promotion of the technological infrastructure. And here ICT, big data and the artificial intelligence are the indispensable dimensions. But it has to be linked to the service delivery. That is not so far happening. Third conclusion that is what we uh, come into is the kind of strategic planning of this ASEAN smart city models need to capitalize the both the digital intelligence for the energy efficiency, as well as the development of the knowledge and the innovation networks for the digital inclusion. And here that is very much included that it's a, how this revolution, how this paradigm to be more inclusive, bringing more uh, people to get benefit that is, that is more important. Here also the challenge lies. So another conclusion that is, uh, we observed in this ASEAN smart city network is uh, that is the needs of these uh, cities are different and they cannot see a kind of uh, uh, one uh, monolithic solution for all because you need to understand uh, each city has uh, its own DNA and this DNA has to be taken into consideration when we are converting or when we are transforming these cities into smart cities. That is where the difference comes. And here we can see a broader um, two uh, different uh, ways of looking into. One is that is the ASEAN smart cities. Most of our, like, like Chiang Mai, that is we did the analysis and Jakarta and then Makassar. Here, these are the cities, uh, basically cities that is uh, sitting in the world countries. Here they are looking for an opportunities for the infrastructure development. And here this ICT infrastructure brings an opportunity. Here basically these cities see incorporating this ICT technology as a kind of a new developmental phase. This is a, we can see from almost all these 26 cities except Singapore. So I, I, I classify Singapore into the other category of the cities like uh, New York and the Takamatsu in Japan and the Bristol. And here, here we are talking about the old cities in new countries. Here what they are looking for is an innovation. 
the pursuit of this smart urbanization that is supported by the innovations. This innovations could be a service delivery. This innovation could bring uh, disaster resilience and this innovations could bring uh, uh, much more maximization of the social benefits where the urban regeneration will be driven by the local innovation and this uh, new type of investments. So here we need to differentiate the needs of these smart cities and their DNA of the smart cities. Then only we can bring a successful and implementable programs. And um, we also see, uh, this is my last slide, and uh, here also we also see faces many challenges. Here we see that is when we are developing the performance indicators and we see, we see uh, integration of the privacy protection as well as the social intelligence is a challenge. How it can be central, that is, these things are in trade-off. Second thing is uh, uh, this smart city building is a partnership, partnership between the industries and the citizens and the governments. How these formulations will be evolving, we don't know because uh, each city is having a different type of mode and different type of policy environment. Second thing, as Casey mentioned, the political rationality. Here we see what, what smart city means. It is looking for a structural innovation and it cannot depend upon a technological innovation alone. This structural innovation need a strong political leadership. Unfortunately, the city leadership, the electoral cycle is five years but the smart city projects go on for more than 10 years. Second thing is who is going to invest? And here we need to see a kind of a reallocation of the risk and reward systems to award more people. And here there is a high risk and high return scenarios also there. And there is also risks is there and this risk should be reallocated to among the different stakeholders and that maximizes the benefits. But if you see and um, this smart city, which, which I think Casey also mentioned, it is a kind of a new integrated infrastructure investment plans or the business model or the common data standards, whatever you see, this is developed in the urban context. But this urban context well fit into this uh, ASEAN political goal. ASEAN political, uh, ASEAN has to, to three communities. ASEAN economic community and the ASEAN socio-cultural community. It, it well fit into this political goal of uh, uh, ASEAN community. Then this, this 26 initiatives, they have a headline target because uh, they wanted to see these smart city solutions are highly transferable and then enable the city to perform for the multiple challenges. So here our ob objective here, so we have a kind of a political endorsement for the smart city investment. Here we have a model for the investment. So we can see that is categorically with the confidence, we can say that is the ASEAN smart city network and this movement is uh, not just a simply trend, but it will be a transformational race for the investments and the talenters. But we need to see that is uh, well, there are different questions that is lying in how these cities had uh, cities can get into the private sector to come together and what could be that innovative financing models and how to formulate these uh, regional action plans so this is areas continuing work and we continue to examine how the uh, cities will be embarking into the smart cities program what are the current plans so we wanted to refine this measurement matrix and also the next phase, uh, we would like to critically assess what is the technology needs of the cities, given that kind of framework conditions. So once these uh, needs are understand, we can see that is uh, what could be the operable financial models. Then finally, we also would like to get your inputs and we wanted to make this journey inclusive of you, sharing your experiences, uh, for the key adjustments that is required in the policy making. One of the outputs that is we are seeing is uh, whether we can develop a kind of guidelines for the smart city building. So this uh, journey has started and uh, with your support and uh, with other network partners like uh, uh, Smart City Council, we would like to make uh, this journey faster, efficient and inclusive. And thank you very much. And uh, this is our uh, 
contact details you can virtually visit iria website and most of our publications and the project related information are available thank you very much thank you ambu uh, let me now uh, share my screen so that uh, i will sort of uh, in a way sum up what we hope to do as a next step So what does it mean? Okay, uh, you know, Dr. Ambu has mentioned about uh, the focus in terms of sustainability, and there are gaps. Definitely, there are gaps. There are differences in the level of development for smart cities. So what I will do is spend the next five minutes to outline a possible collaboration model, and you can see from here that ASEAN alone is actually a sizable market of. Over 660 million people, of which internet users are over 400 million. So it's a very big market uh, relative to China and India. You can see that we are quite close to India and uh, half the size of China. So last year, when Thailand was the chair, they have agreed in November that uh, Singapore should continue to assist the region as the shepherd uh, to provide new ideas and to share best practices and that's what we will do for the next two years so it's this year and next year and this is a possible collaboration model that we hope that uh, we could actually uh, work with uh, our partners in this part of the region where uh, Singapore may act as a shepherd but effectively I would hope that we will collaborate on projects and this research study is a collaboration of a few cities where we would actually get uh, ecosystem partners to work with us and, and, and be part of a project team. So let me share with you uh, towards uh, the end here uh, an example partnering model that I have with uh, National University of Singapore uh, from January to June this year, uh, I actually am an industry partner for the NUS, this M MSC uh, uh, capstone project, where we would help the students to do their projects uh, in a real environment. It's uh, towards the end of the module, whereby uh, they eventually develop the prototype. But when they do the prototype, we will actually assist them to understand about the different uh, technologies, the industry for the technologies. So NUS uh, are working with us again and this is really uh, an example of uh, collaboration in a project to learn about the artificial intelligence, about IoT in a real environment for cold chain logistics. So we assist the students to understand about sensor network instrumented as uh, Dr. Ambu says, IoT, what is the cloud-based solution how do you uh, work on to creating a chatbot, uh, social media for user interaction, and as well as a digital twin using uh, 3D models for uh, using photography. So this is a project that we will start from next month with uh, the NUS community division. I call it LEAP, the LEAP for Smart Cities. There's Learning Entrepreneurship by Attachment Program. It is an industry version of our project with uh, NUS and this time the students will actually be mentored by, by uh, the Smart Cities Network participating members. And uh, the students uh, as, will also learn the uh, Industry 4.0 technologies. They will be briefed by us and then we will actually get them to actually do projects. And this is where we hope to define collaboration projects. So right now, uh, you may actually, uh, you know, take this as a note. Uh, I would like to sort of uh, sum up this dialogue. We have uh, the next 10, 15 minutes to, for Q&A. And uh, we have Dr. Ambu who shared about the research studies and the uh, preliminary uh, outcomes. So uh, if I may sort of now uh, stop my share and uh, invite participants to put your questions into the Q&A. 
in all in inside uh, the Q and A question. So we have ten questions. Uh, let me go through one by one, and if you have an urgent need to ask question, uh, you could uh, raise your hand later. Uh, right now, let me uh, ask. Uh, put in the question. Uh, Alan has asked a question, how can we make sure about the inclusivity of smart cities? How, if some people perceive differently, have different values about the city, like they prefer to live in less modern environment by having more agricultural land to make a living without being insisted to change their way of living? So that's uh, a good question. Dr. Ambu, uh, I hope you can go to the Q&A tab at the bottom. Uh, do you want to answer this question? If not, I'd be happy to answer that uh, real time. Dr. Ambu, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. And, um, this is a good question. And the, the cities are for all, not for, for some people that is uh, who are passionate about the development. And uh, But the thing is, uh, you need to understand that is the most of the cities uh, are the particular cities in this region, in the ASEAN uh, and then the East Asia is already urbanized. And that is the uh, inconvenient truth. And, uh, uh, but, but still, and uh, these technologies, even, even these uh, uh, technologies of uh, smart agriculture, and which is more about uh, uh, application of this artificial intelligence and this uh, some kind of uh, sensor devices, still it is applicable and even for the urban agriculture to improve the productivity and also again this is whether whether we like it or not whether the agriculture or the industrial activities has become a kind of a, a match between the supply and demand and so here also here this kind of connecting these technologies connecting these people with the technologies connecting the supply and the uh, market with the technologies provide the opportunities uh, for, for, for increase the productivity and increase the service delivery. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also need that is uh, this, this, this is one of the drawbacks of uh, mass movement also. And, and uh, now we are coming to the stage and uh, where uh, we find uh, more um, how can I say, and more more um, benefits from, from this kind of technologies. And if it is uh, fine-tuned towards these uh, uh, human systems, basically it is, it is the match between the uh, digital system and the analog system that is already exist and uh, fine-tuned towards the human uh, ecological systems. Thank you, Ambu. Uh, I mean, my short uh, response to this is, is that uh, when people move to the city or are in the city, uh, there has to be uh, some kind of a common common space, common ground in which uh, the city uh, leadership or the national leadership will look at the overall uh, needs of the people and uh, we cannot satisfy every single one. So at the end of the day, uh, it is to drive towards uh, what we call the strategic outcomes of a smart city. And that namely, at least in the ASEAN uh, Smart Cities Network, uh, we say it is, what does it do to improve the lives of the people? Now, how can we make the economy more competitive? And, and thirdly, how can we ensure that there's a sustainable environment? And, and that's uh, one of the focus of uh, what the research uh, study is about. You know, can we make it more energy efficient? And what's the sustainability goal of this research? So I hope, uh, uh, you know, this is really, is a balance to uh, balance uh, the different needs, but achieving the overall goal of the cities. I hope uh, that uh, answers the question. Uh, I, you can have my presentation, but I will discuss with Dr. Ambu regarding his presentation. So I go next to the next question on uh, Vic, by Vic, uh, Vico. How does ASEAN see itself as an emerging hub for global value chain in the era of the circular economy? Would it be possible to transform ASEAN cities as the new industrial symbiosis in the material circulation? Ambu, you want to have a short comment on this? Sure, and, uh... As I mentioned, and, and these this cities and these uh, mega cities and the 
first tier cities is is uh, their economic value or the economic weight has been increasingly and it go by doing day by day and uh, as of now and uh, these uh, cities represent a linear production system where uh, they produce mass and they consume and most of them also goes as a waste and um, we believe and and this this iot that's why we are studying this uh, waste as, as one of the sector for for studying this uh, impact how this can improve the service delivery waste management so here here we find an opportunities for the circular economy or making this uh, cycle of uh, consumption and production um, bring kind of a loop and we here we already identified uh, about five technologies that can be of uh, uh game changer for bringing the sacrality and uh, by by linking this kind of um, new technologies like like uh, sensors and this uh, uh, then platforms there is a creating an iot platform where along the value chain and if you see that the city is where that value chain starts it is the value chain starts from the rural or the urban fringe areas then it gets to the cities and it will it all sometimes it goes to the global value chain so by creating a platform and by linking these suppliers and the uh, users and the are the uh, demand and here we find much more opportunities for optimization of the uh, resource use and as well as the resource consumption that is where we found and uh, iria has done already done a work on how this industry 4.0 type of technologies can um, help asean and uh, uh, so so that 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 report should be available in our website and that can give you a, a better insight and our reports our indicators that will be coming out will help you to understand uh, have this circular look at the at the city level okay uh, thanks abgu uh, my my i am somewhat uh, realistic in terms of the expectation of asean as a group uh, there are different levels of development uh, in the countries so my my take on this is that a lot of the countries in asean will first and foremost focus on their infrastructure uh, as opposed to making a circular economy as a, a priority so i am a bit more realistic that uh, you know even in singapore i have to say that as a layman i find that uh, we are not really recycling a lot of the things that we need to recycle because the structure and the process are not in there yet so can we see asean as a hub yes definitely we are going to be a major economy hub uh, in the world in the next 20 to 30 years but whether or not we we actually uh, evolve to be more a leader in the area of circular economy i think that will take a uh, slightly longer time So that's my take of it, and there are actually uh, other questions. Uh, it is now uh, two minutes to four o'clock. Uh, as this is a Q and A uh, for those who whom uh, you need to be excused by four o'clock as per schedule. Uh, please uh, feel free to exit yourself. But I'd be happy to extend uh, this if uh, Dr. Ambu is willing to stay on for at least another. uh 20 to 25 minutes to answer all the questions so uh we have here uh uh three uh votes for a question by Aris Ananta how will you modify your conclusion with the pandemic we are experiencing now that's a good question uh how has covid-19 uh situation changed your conclusion has it changed your conclusion dr ambu you want to uh, comment on that Yeah, to unmute yourself. Timely question, and and here actually I I I, I wrote a uh, article about something and about this is how the, how the smart city and the COVID and uh, here I find an opportunity and uh, this is unutilized opportunity because uh, we are already locked in and we, this this journey smart city journey has just started. Think about that is that is the. the covid spread and take the jakarta i am living in jakarta and here we see about 1000 deaths and and about 800 people that has been every day it has been at the peak everybody has been identified here we see that is a segregation of the data 
and then here the city has been completely dislinked and here we are the hospitals they are treating the patients they know that is uh, what is the um, condition of the patient and what stage they are and another thing is also the testing centers they are doing it completely in a different location and disclosed location only they are providing the data then the data is supplied to the hospitals and the city management there is a health ministry and that, that is basically the accounting that is how many people affected and the city basically that city that has to uh, make this timely responses whether whether this is uh, social distancing they are the implementers here we find a completely a delinked the data are stored in a separate silos and here this is a traditional way that is how the our cities are performing and if it is a smart city and here we have a platform that is where he this opportunities for the change uh, where that is they can share that information and if this uh, uh, information is uh, uh, tailor made or to use to this users whether the patients or the affected people or the common people and here find a way of more opportunities and these more opportunities are created by integrating this uh, digital new digital systems that is built upon the iot platforms and that could be made responsive by the physical system that is already existing that is where that is in the silo mentality and finally i think it will be uh, getting into that kind of effective or intelligent decision making by the city government that is what the jagata uh, governor was struggling for the, in the initial two weeks and if this this things uh, here we find more opportunities and i maybe my my thinking is uh, one thing that is my my where i can include my study is the resilience component how far the cities could be made more resilient for uh, taking this kind of uh, shocks whether it is the pandemic shock or the disaster shock thank you thank you now uh, we have one question from johans uh, i get the impression that from the different situations in each cities and the different challenges that they have the very first step to achieve smart cities require a very large amount of affordable energy some who think this way believe that nuclear energy can be a highly recommended step what is your take on this statement you want to answer that or, or i can answer that please go ahead and uh... well my my take is that the first step to achieve smart cities in my view does not really require a large amount of affordable energy in this part of the world smart cities uh, when people talk about smart cities it really defines on how they want to uh, achieve uh, certain outcomes and outcome could be related to better government services optimizing their services in singapore when we embark on our smart nation agenda we we don't first decide that we must have a lot of energy no the smart nation in singapore is about three specific areas of improvements and areas that we want to focus first is the smart nation is the digital government how does the government decides to improve their services to some cities i've been to indonesia uh, namely uh, jakarta semarang and bandung to indonesian cities there are two main areas of smart city is number one a lot of people think that it's about having a network of cctvs right that's a start but it's not a smart city yet until and unless you have a sensor network on the ground that you have connectivity to the villages like uh pasetaji from bandung for west java spoke yesterday in a dialogue yesterday so so the first thing that when you talk about digital government is about enablement of the di- government to provide services that's one and having a situation awareness of the city through a command and control command center another important part of a smart city is about citizen engagement and that really goes up to the notion about strategic outcome for quality of lives you must have a good quality of life in order to improve the citizen uh, livelihood and and the platform economy facilitates that and that's where the middle part of the 
private sector coming in. So a smart city, my take of this is that it does not need to have a lot of energy uh, and, and where well, at least uh, for us in Singapore, uh, the government has said nuclear energy is uh, down, down the road, far away. And uh, my take of this statement is that a smart city is really subjective to the city government, the national government to define what they want to achieve out of uh, their, their strategic, uh, uh, you know, strategy. And Dr. Ambu and their research is helping uh, cities in ASEAN uh, to, to do that through their KPIs and their analysis, what needs to be done. So that's my take of it, uh, Dr. Ambu. Uh, what do you think? Okay. Uh, the thing is, uh, one of one of our objective of study is this this uh, this uh, how how this energy system will be changing and uh, mm. our 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 hypothesis by the introduction of this uh, still still our our calculations are going on and uh, different scenarios and uh, uh, this uh, as 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 you could able to see from the transport sector and uh, in the Chiang Mai case. This smart city initiatives are the smart introduction of the smart technologies has the potential to reduce the energy demand and then energy use. This is happening in the transport sector. But coming to the energy sector, there may be a different uh, uh, kind of rebound effect. And uh, one thing, one may, it may reduce this uh, uh, energy demand and uh, by introduction of the renewables and it can also compensate. And uh, But here, but for example, on this uh, prosumer, the concept of the prosumer could be facilitated by the smart city initiatives, where that is, uh, you are not only a producer, but you are also a consumer. So that kind of micro grid could be facilitated by this introduction of these IoT technologies, which will become much more uh, intelligent in distributing their electricity. So our hypothesis is that is that is uh, it will have a positive effect in the energy conservation as well as resulting in the uh, emission reductions. But it has to be proven because uh, uh, because use of these mobile devices, uh, the electronic devices and the servers that is maintaining the big data. There is a study going on it. And, and uh, there is a total consumption of uh, this kind of uh, ICT technologies, ICT architecture is one way that is increasing. So we need to see how what is the net benefit or the net energy saving. And uh, it varies from the, uh, uh, the city to city and also their, their uh, natural or their resource uh, using the potential for uh, resource efficiency. Uh, second thing is on the nuclear and, and uh, we are doing a study on this uh, small uh, reactors and, uh, and also the nuclear acceptance. It is a very contentious issue. I think it is at uh, Singapore specific. Uh, uh, here we need to be taken into consideration that is the safety issues and also the public acceptance and uh, whether it could be a, a solution. Of course, that is a nuclear is a solution. Uh, but the safety and the uh, social acceptance are the two dimensions and uh, that need to take into consideration when you decide about this use of uh, this small size of reactors. Thank you. I'm quite uh, glad to see still uh, over 100 people still on this call. So let me go to the next one uh, by Dr. Morugesh. Do we believe uh, smart cities will concentrate well knowledge and opportunities in a few smart cities only. Uh, how uh, the smart cities model can be applied to rural to avoid rural distress, a migration of people from rural to cities for better living, uh, agriculture as well as for business. Is there any case studies happening such as smart agriculture? Well, I, I can answer this quite uh, clearly because yesterday I actually hosted uh, Pasitaji, the head of the West Java Digital Province, in which he talks about his mission to create a smart province. It's a digital province whereby out of Bandung, as a provisional government, they are creating what they call digital villages. So the digital villages is the model that they will promote smart agri-tech uh, hubs in the rural areas. Uh, there's no uh, prevention of people migrating to cities as seen uh, globally. That, and uh, what Dr. Ambu has shared earlier, that there will be a migration of people seeking for better prospects 
in the cities in the next uh, you know decade but certainly uh, the question being how can we actually also help uh, the rural communities and that is uh, currently and I'm aware uh, West Java is doing it and I'm helping uh, province Isabela in Philippines doing that as well. How about you Dr. Ambu, uh, do you have any comment based on your experience with other cities and other governments in terms of migration uh, to the, from the rural to cities? Yes, I think uh, this, this question is very, very relevant and, and uh, uh, this, this, uh, whether uh, this uh, concentration of the wealth, knowledge and opportunities and uh, uh, this is how we see this is the smart city paradigm that is evolving and uh, still we don't have much experiences to see uh, but, but uh, what what when when I talk to some of the city mayors, I think that some of the initiatives they take is really to see that is this uh, everyone is included and the wealth is shared and uh, people have that equal access to these uh, services. Um, Say so for example, knowledge and this uh, creating these new platforms and uh, and also through so this is online uh, platforms for the grievances and uh, this education. Uh, for, for the city level uh, uh, officials. And here we find more opportunities than, than the constraints. And uh, here this, this opportunities come. So on one example that is, I can say that is the, uh, in Jakarta and previously, if you wanted to make a complaint, uh, there is a governance issue and uh, uh, it, it takes nearly uh, 10 days. That is to make the complaint and this complaint is addressed. And here they make a system where it can be go on online and uh, which is a transparent. This also brings the accountability for the official to respond to it. This is happening in the Mandalay and the Mandalay city of Myanmar. That is one of our case studies. And here the the, the uh, mayor and, and he is an ophthalmologist. He is a doctor and, and uh, he introduced a system, the social platform where there is a people can access him directly. And, uh, and this kind of uh, things help with this kind of equity in access to the services, equity to the governance rights, and also the transparency. This cannot be happen without this uh, introduction of uh, this kind of uh, new technologies uh, that is uh, relatively cheaper. But again, I told under uh, uh, the, the wealth creation, I think uh, there is a possibility that is if you see this model that is operating and uh, here always this is, this is the ASEAN and the other cities, uh, uh, the, the, the cities, governments, they depend upon a service provider. This is the private sector operator. And the city doesn't know under what architecture they are working and because uh, the technology is improving and, and it, is, it is growing very fast. Here there is a possibility that is the city is dominated by a, a company or a group of uh, uh, companies and here uh, we need to see that is uh, how how what kind of uh, new mechanisms could be created and what kind of sandbox could be created to learn. I think I think Jakarta City is working on it and the head of the Jakarta Smart City is a very very knowledgeable person. So this early lessons that is what we get from Jakarta may be a replicable one for the other uh, countries. Second thing is agriculture. Esco, there is a smart city and also we have the smart villages and. Uh, Again, the smart villages, uh, I think Indonesia has about 500 smart villages program. And India also, they have a kind of prop providing urban amenities in the rural areas. It, it focuses on, again, the score about the bringing the electronic connectivity to the villages. So this electronic connectivity and then educational connectivity and then urban infrastructure, uh, then it will help these this, uh, uh, villages link to the markets. One is they can become a kind of self-reliant where much synergy could be developed and also they could be connected to this market which is in the urban centers. So here and in the smart agriculture also there is, but it's a little bit different. Again, the basic is, is common. Here you find a combination of uh, digital platforms and the physical infrastructure that is built upon these needs of the human value system. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ambu. Okay, uh, I, I think we may not be able to have uh, two of us answering all the questions, but if there are questions that are 
specific uh, to Dr. Ambu, I will actually uh, post the question. Uh, so there is one question from Budi Indra Satyawan. Is it possible to add another city included in your study? I'm living in Bogor city, known as a science city that may be more ready. So I think uh, some people may have that question. What, how do others get involved in, in your research study? Could you share? Sure, and, and, and we, are, we are most welcome and we wanted to see more cities uh, inspired by our work and uh, to be included in developing the KPIs, and, but at the same time uh, our resources are limited. And, uh, but one thing, what we, are, what we are trying to do is uh, this key performance indicators. It is a kind of a, a smartness assessment tool and this tool we would like to make it uh, publicly available so that is each city could be able to test their level of preparedness for the smartness. And uh, I think uh, Professor Budhi is from the academia and so we are very happy to collaborate and partner with him. And uh, if he would like to uh, join as, as a partner and, and uh, we are happy to see that is uh, more people join this journey and make it useful. And, and at the end of the day, that is, uh, we want to see win-win formulas develop and evolve and add us to the, all the cities. So I assume they can write directly to you and, and you will uh, advise them the steps to, uh, to join. Am I right? Sure. And we, we can start the dialogue process. I think today is the first day. And okay. so, Good. So we are more more accommodative, but but please uh, understand that is our resources are also limited, uh, but our knowledge is not. So uh, I will answer one question that uh, is asked by somebody, uh, Casey, concerning your collaboration in your MSc program with NUS. What sort of resources are available beside the student time? Okay, uh, I'm not sure uh, what you meant by NUS resource. This is an MSc project whereby we uh, from the industry are uh, doing it pro bono. We're assisting them uh, to support them by working on a project that's been uh, offered by one of our consortium partners. They have a warehouse where they work with uh, industry people in the coaching logistics. They, they have freezers in there. We check the temperature, the IoT will send data. Uh, so we have IoT sensor network in the warehouse to check the temperature and the students will actually uh, take those data, capture it and uh, our partner, another partner create a digital twin of the project and another partner uh, actually have uh, the uh, AI chatbot that can send user interaction where they develop the prototype. All these are pro bono uh, resources that is offered to the students uh, to do the, their work over six months. So that is really uh, the collaboration. But what I have separately on the LEAP program, uh, LEAP, the Learning Entrepreneurship Wire Attachment Program, uh, the Singapore government has $100 million. They are giving grants to students to do the projects with us from June to November. So we effectively, the industry partners, Smart Cities Network gets these students uh, without having to pay them uh, as as uh, our collaboration resources, they work on projects uh, with us. So that's uh, where we are right now. Now, uh, there's no way we can answer all the questions. So let me uh, sort of very quickly sort of uh, yes. go through. Yes, go ahead. Maybe can, can we take one more about this finance? And, uh... ah, yes, where, which one? You, you, you can go ahead and answer the finance question. Which one? I think it is uh, a Ministry of uh, Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs. Uh, the, the question is, yes, funding is one of the main challenges in promoting the smart cities. Okay. Please elaborate more on possible access of fundings. Okay, go especially ahead. Especially for small cities in ASEAN. Okay, go ahead. No, I don't have money. You have. You have the private sector. And, uh, okay, okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, let me read the question. I saw this question. Uh, as funding is one of the main challenges in promoting smart cities, please elaborate more on possible access of funding, especially for smaller cities. So this is how I would really uh, uh, encourage the public-private partnerships. If the cities, so there are only uh, three uh, main areas of funding. Uh, 
uh, the cities themselves may have funding. So uh, I'm the advisor uh, for Kuching in Malaysia. The state government, the Sarawak state government uh, invested 1 billion Malaysian ringgit last year, uh, 2018, sorry, 2018 to put in the smart infrastructure, to put in the sensor network, wireless access, to establish the smart infrastructure first. So our preferred model is that the city must allocate funding. But I'm aware a city uh, in the province like West Java, only 20% of their overall budget comes from the, the national government. So there's an 80% gap in, in their funding model. So what, what do they do? They will apply for funding from uh, the uh, International Finance Corporation. So the IFC, the World Bank, uh, the Asian Infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, grants, and as well as the Asian Development Banks, are uh, really uh, a key source of budget. I hosted ADB, Asian Development Bank, back in 2016. They wanted to encourage the private sector to partner with them, and I have seen uh, their budget of 1.5 billion dollars for healthcare and education in Asia PAC. So Asia Development Bank has got money as long as the governments apply for those funding. But the third one is where the private sector comes in, right? The private sector uh, must be prepared to invest in the cities. And I have seen examples of that. Uh, the smart street lighting, I met with the World Bank. Uh, they said that if any city is willing to embark on smart street lighting, converting thousands of their street lights into LED lighting, there is a guaranteed 40% savings, even up to 70% savings of energy usage. So if a city spends a million dollars and uh, after changing the LED lighting, uh, they, they save uh, 600,000. That means any, any company that is willing to invest in putting up the infrastructure will have uh, hopefully a concession over 10 years or 15 years where the government allow them to change the system but the savings from the city the city will have to pay back to uh, the the uh, private sector investors uh, that is a current model of a ppp the other one is really smart tourism uh, one of my members uh, do that they actually Tell the city, you don't have to invest in smart tourism. I will put in uh, resources to develop the app, but you must allow me to, uh, when people use the app, to, to really look at the tourist sites. Uh, people who advertise on their app can uh, get back the money. So, but then the, the, the tourism board must be willing to accept that. So that will be the three part of uh, areas of business model that I will see, right? And, and uh, it, it is true, uh, funding will become a big issue. Yeah, you want to say something, Ambu? Yes, and uh, so I need to disagree with you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, it's okay. No, no, this is joking. I think that, that, is the, that the funding is the focus of our, our, our next phase of the study. And, and mm. here... Uh, we need to see that is we are looking at the different models that is exist at the all the world at the level in the Europe and uh, in Japan and also the ASEAN. I think the funding is the critical. And uh, but if you know if you see that is the question is more about the small cities, and the the, the, the situation is really precarious. And uh, no no city is rich. And uh, they basically every day they actually the the budget every day they are they are facing is very 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 precarious and, and they cannot think about the smart initiative. So if you are really thinking about that is where the funding sources, basically there are, there are three major sources. I think as has mentioned, and uh, it should be coming from the national budget. And these are the kind of uh, lighthouse projects. I think uh, uh, so like, for example, China and India and uh, Indonesia, they have started the smart city program. Still, they don't know what they are doing. And, and uh, again, again, uh, here we need a focus and, and uh, and this, this is a kind of lighthouse uh, that is coming from the national budget. And um, second thing is uh, going to the consumers. I think that is the citizens. That means you are taxing more, and, and uh, which is a little bit politically risky. And, and uh, unless otherwise you find the gains and uh, the, 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 uh, the people will not be easily satisfied. And, and they are not willing to pay more. 
uh, what that is coming from it. And third one is this uh, kind of community phased funding. And uh, for example, some of the uh, initiatives in Europe, and we have seen that is the uh, it, uh, it is another way of uh, uh, partnership. And uh, where the philanthropists also coming in, this big big uh, philanthropists they put one third of it, and then city put one third, and it is a kind of crowdfunding. And uh, these examples. Uh, it is also another type of public-private partnership model. Uh, but coming to this international financial institution, they, they may be luring and, and uh, but uh, unfortunately, and I worked with the IM part of the ADB system, and uh, it may be looking uh, attractive, but, but still access to the funds. The funds are available, but the access to the funds are not easy. And uh, here, cities cannot be a kind of countersignatory, and uh, cities are not rated, uh, their financial status is not rated high. So there is a guarantee system comes from the national government. So here that is where the difficulty comes. So in, for, for just for sharing an example, and uh, India has about 500 uh, uh, smart cities and uh, they know that is the cities governments, but really in Europe, most of the cities go for bond. They issue the bonds and then uh, market buys it. And so they generate the revenue. But in the case of uh, Indonesia and India, and they cannot go to the market because uh, nobody believes and uh, the cities when issue the bonds. So what, what the government did was, and uh, they put a 500, 50% as a kind of grant. And then uh, the 50%, they give a kind of guarantee and they, they are allowed to go with the, with the central government in the guarantee and then the cities and in partnership with the state governments, they can go to the market, they can cap mobilize the uh, funding for, for the initial projects. So this is uh, what happened, and on the other way, uh, um, in in China, and uh, there is a state-funded program, and where basically it is a kind of performance-based, and they give, uh, they set some of the uh, targets and the performance targets. Uh, so they, they incrementally they release the funds. So 20% is uh, reached means the next year they release more funds. So it is a kind of performance rating and uh, so very different models are uh, existing and uh, we need to think about it and uh, that will be the focus of our uh, next study and we would like to uh, get inputs from the Ministry of uh, Economic Coordination for that project and for that assignment. Thank you, Ambu. Of course, uh, you know, everybody is hoping and, and praying that the cities and the national government would allocate budgets, as uh, I shared earlier, that the Indian government did that, the Singapore government did that, and uh, hopefully more and more governments begin to see the light and, and they should fund it. And uh, that's why I have alluded that, that uh, they could package it as their IT budget, and I'm sure uh, there's budget. So uh, it is now 4.30. I, I really have another uh, call in two minutes. So uh, I'm sorry that I could, we could not answer all the questions. Nevertheless, uh, you have my email. You can actually uh, post those questions to us. And Ambu and myself will be happy to continue in our dialogue uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. And hopefully, I'll see some of you uh, at uh, the event itself. And for that, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, my Thanks to Dr. Ambu for taking his time an hour and a half to join us in this update of the uh, area realizing smart cities research studies. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Casey, and thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.